Um, I'll take you just a quick through, journey through the life, I suppose, to see where it ended up to where that state was. Um, I was a normal child and stuff like that, and um, at the age of five, soldiers come to a oh, gosh, look at this. So were you actually from the area? No, nah, I was, you, was in, um, answer the question. Oh, yeah. I was taken by soldiers at the age of five and like for the Roman forces then. I was born in Sicily and that's where I was taken on that island there and just pretty much... Uh, there's lots of kids like that too. I realised it realised too recently about that. And um, they just pretty much detuned you emotionally. They raped and beaten and... Um, just all that sort of stuff, you know, typical soldiers, things they do to people just to make them dehumanise them, I suppose. And then, um, just had this big loss of love from my mother and family and stuff, cause, and just kept on hoping, hoping, hoping that someone would come and take me home. And that never happened. <laughs> and then, just sort of hold on to hope and hope, and then it just, to me it felt like it was a rock, the only rock I had to hold myself together and that slowly wore away to like a stone and just a pebble and just just in some moment just all realised it's never ever going to happen and just everything fell apart and just succumbed to where I had to be. But there was a lot of rage and anger inside me towards my mum particularly um, but also towards all the soldiers, towards everybody really and so I became a pretty nasty person. Um, I forwarded it off to that time, um, when I saw this guy standing around talking, I just started to, just, just, just this small glimmer of hope was still left in my heart about love, it was still a concept, I just thought it was all bullshit, it's just a bullshit concept, it's just a lie, it's just a total lie, but then when I heard him speaking, it just started to resonate with something in me, I didn't know what, and, and just go away my own little times, when I had some time to myself, usually sleep time I suppose, and just, like, Trying, like some things would come up, was starting to stir things, and I didn't understand it, and to go and sort of hear him more, and just started stirring a lot of stuff up inside of me, and realizing, you know, everything that's happened, I suppose, and what I've become, because I wasn't a nice person at all. I killed people, innocent people, raped people, as well, hurt children, all from the anger that was like I didn't know how, well, I obviously didn't know how to deal with it, and just had such rage at the world. I didn't want any, if I couldn't be happy, no one could be happy. It's not possible, it's not real. And um, I've actually had some spirits come back now, now that I start to accept my identity a bit more and um, had a sense about them. They've come and, like, one of them's really still angry with me, still in a bad spot 2,000 years ago. There's a lady as well that I raped back then. She was still in a bad state, but she's doing pretty good now after talking and stuff. But um, yeah, it's just tough to. Seeing him, I suppose, it started to stir things up and started to change me a little bit inside. I started looking at my emotional side, I suppose, again, it was still just, it was pretty much a flame gone out, but it was just, just a little spark left on the wick that come up again. Yeah. The Roman army used to take children from their parents who they felt would have good genetic stock at a very, very young age and basically beat them and rape them and do all sorts of things to just dehumanise them into just a fighting machine. And, and that was basically Corny's upbringing, if you like, from the age of five onwards. So about what age were you when you first saw a Christ and was doing a crowd control? This dude? Uh, yeah. What, you, what age were you when you first... Um... Uh, it was, it like there was time in Syria for a while in the Balkans and come down to Caesarea. There was political stuff going on which brought a lot of the troops into Jerusalem. They usually had auxiliary troops that didn't need proper forces there. So there's some political stuff going on that required them. And um, from Syria, it's somewhere like, oh, I don't know for sure, I don't really care about ages, but it would have been around probably in the low 30s, because I died at 34. Yeah. Is there some experience if you were in the position you were in? Yeah, because I was only from Syria, that's when I became an Optio, which is a sergeant, and then from not long after that, became a centurion. Yeah. Corny was a huge man, like, he was six foot four and m even more solid than he is now, yeah. and had his huge hands. <laughs> I just remember his hands a lot from 
Nej, men jag var skoj. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, he was just this, he was just this huge fighting machine, really. Um, he would have been standing a foot taller than anybody at the back of the crowd. Well, back then, too, people were generally a lot shorter than they are now. Yeah. So, to be six foot four back then was like you were a giant, you know. And, yeah, just, you know, he was bigger than two ordinary men. And, but, but muscle. <coughs> Corny, can you tell us something about your conversion process or your decision to, to teach and um, afterwards? Teach? I didn't teach anybody. Didn't teach. Nah. Did you did you make any um, decision after your experiences with with Jesus that? Um, well, 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 perhaps we should skip back and answer the lady's question oh, about my own death, oh. and then mm. and because yeah. it's all related as to what happened mm. to Corny as well. So what we'll try to do is dis we'll describe these events from both of our perspectives because we were both obviously involved in those in the events leading up to my death um, so I'll start I'll start about uh, a week before my death um, I felt I needed to be in Jerusalem it was the time of the Passover and and I just felt that it was a good good time for me to be there I also had a feeling that things perhaps weren't going to be as good as what I'd hoped them to be but what was happening behind the scenes is many of the so-called disciples and apostles were actually were not understanding the message that I had. And they also felt, as do many people today actually still feel, that um, I don't know what I'm talking about as much as I should know. And so they had this feeling that, you know, they wanted me to be the king of the Jews still on earth. And so they started to actually organise some things behind the scenes without my being aware. And what they would try to do is they would try to organise conflicts between myself and the Jewish Sanhedrin. And, uh, and so that sort of brought come to a peak during that week of the Passover being in Jerusalem. On the day of my arrest, um, I was, uh, I'd spent most of the day in Jerusalem speaking in the, in the temple. And there were huge amounts of outcries because a few days earlier, um, I'd caused a riot in the temple. Um, so you know how when it talks about the money changers turning over the, in the Bible? Uh, there's a section in the Bible that talks about um, that I went through the whole temple tipping over everybody's tables that they had money on and animals on. What used to happen is they used to have all of these animals in the temple itself, like a slaughter yard really it was, that people would have to buy because they were consecrated and they would, so they'd charge 10 times the amount that they'd normally charge for that animal and the person would have to buy that animal and then they'd slaughter the animal as a, as a sacrifice for their sins and, and the priesthood would get the animal and eat the animal. So it was also part of how the priests survived, right? So the temple was just like, like in the courtyard, just totally covered with animals. And it stunk like a slaughter yard, really. Um, it was just terrible. And I, and I often made comments about it when I went to Jerusalem. And uh, in this particular time, I made a comment about how everybody was, um, you know, buying things at 10 times the price that they needed to, you know, and that wasn't, you know, that was so unfair. And I just, all I did was say that. I stopped, I stopped everybody first <laughs> and then said it. And... It just triggered some things in everybody and everybody went nuts. Like they all just felt all of that injustice all in that instant. And then they just, there was just a riot in the temple. So they went through tipping over all of the money, stealing the money from the people who were selling and all, all sorts of things went on. And of course the priests were highly concerned because they felt that I'd begun it. I wasn't involved in it myself. So I didn't actually do any of the things described in the Bible. All I did was just say the words. Anyway, that caused a big uproar, and so the next time, the next few days, I was in the temple. I'd get lots of criticism from the priests, and then behind the scenes, there's also my disciples trying to organise these conflicts, if you like, between myself and the priesthood. And so, the, no matter what I did to uh, act lovingly, my the people, many of the people who were following me, were were trying to stir up even more trouble. So it just and I'd try to address it with them, but, but uh, 
but they wouldn't listen either because they wanted me to be the king and so forth and it just it got out of hand basically and so by the the day of uh, that I was captured I was hiding out actually in the garden of Gethsemane and uh, and I'd asked some of my friends to just keep a watch out for me uh, so that it, I could leave in time and uh, but I also was praying a lot about uh, about the fact that nobody seemed to be getting the truth even my own disciples the people who were following me weren't getting the truth either and and I was praying a lot to God about that about what how I could prove the truth to them rather than just speak the words and they not get get the truth at all and uh, and I could feel that things were just coming up to a boiling point really and so uh, so eventually Judas and if it wasn't Judas it would have been one of the others um, organized for the Sanhedrin to actually come and capture me um, and they wanted me out of the way by this stage they'd already had two attempts on my life previously um, that were done with with a, um, an assassin but uh, both of them failed and uh, and so this time they wanted to make sure of it so they actually arranged Judas to come up and uh, and and show them who exactly I was in the dark um, because it was dark. So that's uh, how I was captured. Um, and he thought that I would fight. He thought that I'd encourage the disciples to fight. So he he thought that he would he was the way he thought was that he was encouraging an uprising that I would then eventually take my full control as the leader and everything would be fine. That's how he thought. He didn't realise that, that no matter how much I said to him the opposite, he didn't realise um, that that wasn't going to be what I would do. And he was just so, he was so um, shocked when, when I resulted, when I um, responded passively. And uh, that's what eventually caused his suicide. He was just so shocked at my own response, um, and because uh, he he was a very good friend of mine as well, and still is actually a very good friend of mine. Um, he's in the celestial spheres now. And uh, then there was a big, basically similar to what the Bible describes. I went back and forth between Herod and Pilate, and eventually got into the hands of uh, this man. Mm. And. And basically, um, Mel Gibson's The Passion, who's seen that? Most of you have seen that? Um, most of what's described in there is fairly accurate. Um, and I suppose the you know, question you're asking, I think there was you no know, healing, but um, um, my job was to nail him to the stake, which wasn't a cross. Um, it's like a pole sort of thing. And so nailing him, had a spike and was nailing the mallet into his hands and saw his eyes and just looking at me just full of love and that was just enough. I had enough then. Just so much stuff was stirring up. I just threw the mallet down just walked off, which pretty much gave myself a death sentence too from the Roman army. Just sentenced you're dead. And um, I don't know what happened in that scene after I just walked off and um, went into sort of hiding There's someone. I haven't figured any of this stuff out because I've got this feeling but I haven't got into anything so I haven't got the emotional side of it and it's coming up soon, I can feel it but um, there was a woman I know, I knew I don't know the connection with her though like what she was to me someone close, which is unusual um, and she hid me for two weeks until I found, I had a friend it used to be a good friend of mine in um, as, as a soldier, his name was FAL, and um, but earlier on we used to fight together and be quite like close to each other. We both went through the same experiences as a kid in the same way, and um, we grew grew quite a bond. You just have to love someone, sort of thing. You had a good friend, and you had to share something out of yourself. And um, this is way back, and but they could sort of we had to keep it kind of quiet, like we might just sort of like nod to each other sort of thing, let you know you're okay mate sort of thing or but then they started picking up and all that sort of stuff and they just would not have any of that, any sort of niceness didn't happen so they separated us, went to different sort of legions and stuff like that and 
but I think they set up stories, you know, to try and pit us against each other, to create hate back in us again. Like they pitted words, and we could never justify, like, could never find out if it was true or not about if that person said that against you sort of thing or they'd done something and it put you in, like got some punishment for that like hadn't done anything and so this hate grew between us or slowly and you could never find out if, what the truth was but because there's already hate within us it's pretty easy to like trigger it um so back to my last two weeks of my life um i think have a funny feeling he like dogged me in where i was sort of thing and um they come and found me soldiers and yeah, he'll hit me away. Um, it just there's a crowd, just crowds of people. Just being such a big person, and they, everybody in that time, just feels so powerless. Everybody want to have a piece of me, basically. Just everybody. And um, and I just would not give in. Wouldn't just kept fighting and fighting and fighting. I was taken to an open public area. And just beaten and beaten and beaten and beaten. I think I had my back broken because I can't remember any feeling in my legs. And they had a, they speared me to the ground through my shoulder. I speared to the ground and had fingers cut off, tips cut off. They actually ripped open my stomach and starting to get all intestines spilling out sort of thing. I just laid there for four days until I eventually died. But I remember last thing I saw, the last thing I remember in my body too was my breath, just, that's all I had, it was, told me I was still alive, and you could just hear the last breath just eventually just, was it gone, but I remember the saddest or sad for me, because the last thing I saw was my mother's eyes in the crowd, you could just see her like down low between her legs, just looking, and you just see the love still that was there. So from, the, so from the start of my life to the end, the rest of my tour is just a lot of bullshit. Life is actually real. I had to, it took that long to find it out. And I just thought it was all fake. Just a lie. Was all the stuff that happened to me you told me it was. I just believed everything that happened. And um, the same thing too, when I passed in the spirit world, there's after hearing what um, Jesus was talking about um, to everybody, had this belief that you go to a place of heaven and it was just another load of crap. We got to some place that was really horrible, just full of darkness and just cold and there's no one around. And because I didn't want anybody around. And just in a heap for about, I think it was roughly 70 years or something, just lying on the ground curled up and just didn't want to be around anybody. Just hated everybody, hated the world. Just went to a place because of the things I'd done that were quite, it's not a very nice place. And it took that long. It took so long until I eventually wanted to face some of the stuff. And I remember somebody coming up, I'm not sure who it was, I think it was a guide that I had during my whole life. And they just come down to help me up, just took my hand and just sat up on my knees and just wanted to listen at last. Just surrendered after fighting and fight, I was still fighting in the spirit world. Just fighting against everything I felt, fighting against all things that happened, not letting it come in emotionally. When that time changed or I wanted to feel it, that's when things started to move again. So I watched Corny getting tortured from the spirit world. And uh, it, was, yeah, it was a really horrific death that he had. It was made as an example for any others, any others to dissent the Roman army, any others that want to, any population, people that want to have a fight against them. It was showing a force, just letting everybody know they're under control. Mm. And he basically, what's the word when you get out of an army without getting approval to get out dissent. of the army? Absent without leave. Uh -huh. hey, well. no, there's another word. Deserter, deserter yeah. yeah. So he was treated as a deserter. Yeah. <laughs> so, really, the experience of Cornelius should give us a lot of hope because he went into the hells yeah. and he progressed to the 22nd sphere yeah. to allow him to combine and come back here. So, um, I guess we all you know, uh, treat you, I know you say you're ordinary, but 
he's still special to us. Yeah. Um, whereas Cornelius is a stranger to most of us, I guess. Yeah. And it's just a wonderful feeling that um, mm. listening to you know, your early history, mm. it, it gives me a lot of hope. Well, it is for everybody because there's so many people that have had horrible lives and stuff, and but a lot of that stuff, you know, when you. Well, I, in my life, there was love at the start, and there was actually love was real at the end. That's what I found out. That's right at the end, and just all that crap in between was nothing I could enjoy because I didn't know the truth. But he passed into the hills because of all of the the terrible things that he'd done in his life, and and had to work through all of those things emotionally. And uh, and he he was the uh, I think his soul pair was the fourth soul pair to enter the twenty second sphere state. So after coming from that kind of a background on the earth, um, being the fourth soul pair to enter the 22nd sphere state, you can see his strong desire for love, you know, in, once he connected with all of that. And uh, yeah, just, and that's a very unique experience. Of all the 14 that have returned, um, Cornelius has probably had the, one of the most unique experiences um, of, of all the 14 who have returned in the sense that of all the 14 who have returned, many of the 14 entered the hills when they passed, but only for very brief periods of time. And, uh, and so, you know, it was uh, his experience is probably, he, he had the worst experience in the hills that, that, that all of the 14 have experienced.